I can't stop thinking about that end grain bowl. Hi, I'm Kent and welcome to Turn a Wood Bowl. You know, a while back I turned an ingrained piece of ditch wood. Yeah, I pick up wood from ditches. Uh, doesn't everybody do that? This is what the bowl turned out to be. And I kind of applied some of the techniques and the aesthetics and the design that I would do for a side grain bowl. And it sort of worked. I mean, the grain's kind of interesting on the outside here, but look at the inside. That's really cool with the end grain because we're looking right across the end grain. It's really cool and totally different than a side grain bowl. And that got me thinking, wait a minute, why don't I do something that really showcases that end grain? So that's what I'm going to do today for you guys. So check this out. We're going to do another end grain turning, but this one's going to be a little bit more dramatic and a little bit more showy, and it's going to show off that end grain. And I think it's got some great potential. You might want to try this yourself when you get a chance. All right, let's check it out. Okay, so I've got this log, and actually this is a great project to use a log that's like this that's short. A lot of times you see a short log like this and you think, well, and you can't really do much with it as far as making a big side grain bowl, but you can do a project like we're going to do right here, and you actually don't even need that much of the log. As a matter of fact, I'm going to cut this log in half. I'm going to cut off one of the sides first just to remove that material and start off with a, a fresh area, and then I'm going to split this log in half. What I'm doing here with the chainsaws are I want to make sure I do not touch the ground with my chain. That's a surefire way to dull a chainsaw blade really quick. So what I did is I cut down as far as I could and then flip the, the log over and then do a, just a light cut up into finish up that, that separation. So I'm gonna cut down between the two halves of this log. And actually the two little blocks that I have there on the ground are helping to prevent me from getting into the ground with the chain. So I flipped the log over. I've already got it mostly cut. And make sure you have the, the bar all the way into the, the opening first before you start running the saw and then just pull it up through the, the cut and it will sever that very quickly without giving you a kickback. Well, the bark is not going to be part of this project, and I think I, I knew that before, and it's pretty obvious now. It just fell right off, which is fine. That's no big deal. Okay, so this is going to be a little interesting because the pith is not in the center of this blank, and I'm not going to true this up. So in other words, I want the natural edge of this log to be the outside of the bull, so I'm not going to be cutting that and making it perfectly round, but I do want to find the center of this piece so I'm going to measure that and just divide it by half, and I measure it from four angles across and then at about 45 degrees from those, that first cross. Using my four spur bit, I'm going to mount this into the lathe with the tailstock, and this is basically a traditional end-to-end -end mounting. Oops, that little bit of bark that I thought I could leave there has got to come off. So let me chisel that off. Okay, now it'll rotate. <laughs> so this is a pine. I don't know the exact species. It's a, it's a yellow pine. For whatever reason, it, it's very wet, but it doesn't have a lot of sap in it, which I'm very thankful for because some of the trees with a lot of sap are can be very difficult to turn. And honestly, I don't know why that might be. I don't know if this, this is because of the section of the tree that this was cut out of and maybe the sap all gathered in a different portion of the tree. Whatever the case, this wood is pretty much just wet. It's not sticky, which is what you typically find pine. Now I'm getting a lot of pushback from this because the way I have this mounted at the moment the blank is just a little bit higher in one spot, so it really wants to push that bevel. I'm trying to apply down pressure on the tool rest so I can make a nice clean pass into the bowl, but it's really fighting me. So I'll just keep making passes until we eventually get a clean pass across here. You'll be able to see the difference in the cut. You can see how it's vibrating there and pushing me back. 
So you want to make sure you continually tighten the tailstock when you're doing this too. Because of the wet wood, the teeth in the four tooth spur in the headstock is going to dig in and so is the tailstock quill. And as they're digging in, they need to be tightened up, otherwise they may loosen themselves. So I'm going to mark where the tenon will go. Now this is an ingrain turning, and remember that we have to use a tenon with ingrain. If I were to do a mortise or a recess and expand the base of this, there's a good chance that I'm just going to break grain apart and then the bowl will come apart. So we instead will use a tenon and the tenon will use a compression force on those ingrain fibers and create a very nice strong firm hold on the bowl blank. I have an irregular shaped outer edge there. You can see where the high spot was coming around. It was making the bowl gouge dance around quite a bit. Now this is my half inch 55 degree bevel swept back bowl gouge that I'm using at the moment. This is kind of my personal go-to gouge that I enjoy using. You can use any type of bowl gouge you'd like. You can, you can use a scraping tool as well. Now, a scraper with an ingrain turning like this probably would, would not yield the best results. Why, you might be asking? Well, think about what we're doing. We're cutting across all of the open ends right now. See the shavings coming off? They're not really shavings. They're more like little bits coming off there. That's because it's the ends, the tips of the straws or the fibers of those end grains. We're not cutting any kind of long fibers. So it's creating a... We really want to cut these, these ends. If we scrape them, there's a chance we're going to tear them. And when we tear them, we start ripping them. And, and then we get a really awful, messy surface that's got tool marks and ruts in it. And there's no way to sand that out either. The only way that it can be cleaned up is to cut down to the deepest torn ingrain fibers and make a good, clean cutting pass across those. Okay, now this might be, you might have noticed something a little different here. I'm working from the rim down to the base. Well, there again, this is a supported grain cut for an in-grain turning. This is not like most of the bowls I typically turn, which are side grain bowls. A side grain bowl, we typically want to turn from the rim, I'm sorry, from the base up to the rim. With an in-grain bowl, we want to work from the rim down to the base of the bowl. That's because we have we want longer supported grains under the area that we're cutting. Now I've got a video all about supported grain cuts and if you haven't seen it and if you're questioning what I'm saying right now you might want to see that video because it helps spell out exactly what I'm talking about and understanding a grain supported cut is critical for making a good quality surface on your wood bowls. This wood is, and the, and the fact that I'm cutting across those ingrains is really taking its toll on this bull gouge pretty quickly. So I need to go ahead and sharpen it again. Just bring it back up to the sharpening station and just quickly work both those bevels until both bevels are clean up to the cutting edge. It doesn't take long to sharpen, but it is critically important that you sharpen your tools every time it needs to happen. Okay, and here I'm basically creating the shape of the bottom of the bowl. You can see, if you watch from the top, I'm shaping the profile of the bowl here. And as I'm turning, I'm aware of the tool against the wood, but what I'm doing is I'm looking across the bowl. From my point of view, I'm looking at the top of the bowl, kind of what you're doing right here by looking at the top of the bowl and watching the shape as it forms. And I'm making sure I'm getting a nice fluid curve that I want for the bottom of this bowl. It's funny because this log was relatively short and I cut it in half. And in reality, it's much more wood than I need to turn this. We only really need a, a small sliver of that initial log to turn this particular bowl. There again, look at the shavings coming off. They're more like flakes coming off. That's all of the ingrain fibers being cut. There are no big curly shavings. You can see them all over the lathe too. It's more like dust. 
that's the end of the straws or the ends of the ingrain being sheared off. And you really want to take your time here. You see I've got a really nice smooth bevel riding cut going on here. That's going to assure that we have got a really nice clean surface and those ingrain fibers are being cut and not ripped out. Look how wet that wood is. Is making a really nice clean pass across here. Now remember this type of pass and making a clean smooth advance across the bull surface right there is all done by body movement. My hands and my arms are not moving. I'm just leaning my weight forward as that gouge progresses across the cut. Okay so I'm going to use my spindle detail gouge and create an inside dovetail angle on my tenon. That way it will match the jaws of the forejaw chuck very well and we'll have a nice clean connection to the, to the chuck. The surface of the shoulder is a little bit rough so I'm going to use the bull gouge and I'm going to clean that up. Just to make a really light cut just to cut off all the tops of those ingrain fibers and so we've got a nice clean shoulder there. Now I'll go back to the spindle detail gouge and work down into that crease. I want to make sure there's nothing, no material in there that's going to interfere with the connection to the chuck. Okay, so we have the bottom of the bowl turned. I'm going to take the four spur drive out of the headstock. And we'll install the four jaw chuck and we'll mount the bowl. There you can see how important it is that the shoulder rests right up against the top of the chuck jaws and it does not sit down into the bottom of the chuck. I'm going to use the tailstock here to stabilize this and keep it under control while I'm removing material. We'll take the tailstock off in a little while. You always want to bring that tailstock up if you can for added support and stability while you're turning. Also, I'm going to be making passes 90 degrees to the headstock, which is a little bit violent for the tenon, and it can create the tenon to become jarred or come loose in the in the forejaw chuck. But with the tailstock there, Everything's pretty much pinned in, so you can make a little bit more aggressive cuts with the tailstock supporting the bowl. Now keep in mind, this is not a side grain mounted bowl, and I'm a little bit leery. I'm trying to stay out of the line of fire or the line, the rotation, rotating line of this bowl, because an outer section of this could easily break away. If any of those grains decided they just want to give up and the centrifugal force of the bull turning contributes, they could just come flying off in a big chunk. So I, I'm trying not to stand directly in front of this bull blank. Now right there I was making a little bit too aggressive cut. I was making a very thick deep cut and I actually slowed the lathe down and caused the belt to skip there. All you need to do is back up the bowl gouge a little bit and take a little bit thinner cut if you ever get in a position like that. To start these cuts and to make sure they stay smooth and straight compared to the remainder of the cut and because of I have that irregular rim I'm applying down pressure into the tool rest. I'm not trying to use the bowl as support. Instead I'm using the tool rest and keeping pressure down into the tool rest so that the gouge stays in a straight line based on the tool rest, not the bowl. And that's going to assure that you get a nice clean straight cut. Here again, I'm taking a pretty aggressive deep cut there and I'm, I slowed down the lathe. So I'm going to back up and take about half of that. 
And then we'll do that in two passes instead of one deep, quick pass. You can get a little too aggressive if you're not careful. The amount of shavings and the moisture in them are incredible. It's just coating everything right now. Keeping that center mass in the middle of the bowl acts to stabilize the bowl as well. This bowl is going to be relatively thick, but we still don't want the outside rim or outside edge of this flexing much while we're turning. And that center mass will help stabilize that. I'll tell you what, I'm going to go clean my visor because I can barely see at the moment. And while I'm doing that, if you would please click that like button below the screen because you, YouTube's algorithm sees your click and it will help send this video out to more people and that helps everything out. And I greatly appreciate that. So thank you so much. Okay, I can see a little bit better now. I'm doing something that's technically not right. I am cutting against the supported grain direction here. This is the direction that you normally cut when you're doing the inside of a side grain mounted bowl, going from the rim down into the interior of the bottom of the bowl. However, I really need to be working from the center out on an ingrain bowl. However, because this bowl is almost flat, we're really just cutting cutting those top ingrain fibers and they're, they're actually supported with plenty of support behind them. So at a slight angle like this bowl has, I'm okay making a cut going from the rim down to the bottom on an ingrain piece. If this bowl had any deeper walls, then I wouldn't be able to do this. I would be tearing out material and I would have really bad ingrain tear out on the sides of the bowl on the inside. But in this case, since it's almost horizontal and we're pretty much cutting across those end grain fibers, we're not seeing much tear out. Also, the moisture content in the wood is really helping to reduce that tear out. Green wood is the best to cut if you want a good clean cut and an easy turning experience because those cells in the wood are just plump with moisture and they cut very, very easily and smoothly, almost in any direction. And quite honestly, you could make cuts against the supported grain direction when you have really green wood like this. And usually you're gonna get pretty decent results still. It's not a good habit to get into because you wanna learn good grain support direction and turn with the grain supported direction. But you can't always do that. It's not a major deal if, if you're dealing with green wood. So I'm just going to work this down now. Remember, we've got the four jaw chuck in the back, so I'm not depending on the tail stock here. And in just a moment, I'm going to remove that connection to the tail stock, and then we'll get the tail stock out of the way. When you're working on creating an even thickness from the rim to the bottom of the bowl, one of the biggest takeaways is to make very light passes, progress very slowly. What we're doing is we're actually sneaking up on that final thickness. We don't want to make aggressive cuts when we're down there. And we want to make really clean cuts. And one great way to do that is to get back to your sharpening station and sharpen that bowl gouge. Uh, we need a really sharp bowl gouge to make sure that those last few passes are super clean and leave a very nice smooth cut surface. And it only takes a couple seconds to get over to the sharpening station and get that bowl gouge sharp again. So I'm picking up where the high spot begins and working down into the interior of the bottom of the bowl.
Remember, the center of the bowl turns at the slowest rate compared to the rest of the bowl. The outer rim is turning much faster than the inside of the bowl. So that means you also have to slow down your pace at the center of the bowl. Don't push across those fibers in the center of the bowl thinking they're going to get cut out smoothly. If you continue a fast pace into the bottom center of the bowl, you're going to rip out fibers and you're going to have pit marks in there and you really don't want that. So slow down your pace when you get to the middle of the bottom of the bowl. Here I'm just feeling for any, any irregularities or any high spots that I want to address before I get down to the very bottom. Okay, now we can take that nub off. We absolutely don't need this nub anymore now. The tailstock and that nub are completely in the way, so we're going to go ahead and turn those off, get those out of the way, and finish up the bottom of this. It's kind of neat that the center of the bowl is not where that pith is. But we need to make a really clean cut in that center, so I don't want there to be any marks so that your eye goes from the pith that's not centered to the true center of the bowl. I have my tool rest a little high here, or a little low rather. I need to bring it up just a bit so my cutting edge is right on center. I want a nice clean cut. I've got a video all about tool rest, and I address the concept of the height of the tool rest and why we position it where we position it. So you want to check out that video as well. Again, very light passes here and slow that paste right down to the center so that you cut everything off cleanly. I can tell there's a little bit of a flat spot there and I want that bottom interior to be concave and fluid with the total curve of the bowl. So you make very light cuts here. And when it's done well, you can't even tell where we were just turning. It's a little bit high still. I'm going to make a, again, a very light, very, very delicate pass here. Now that bull gouge is almost completely open as well. That was a high spot that I was dealing with there that I wanted to smooth out. And look what happens when you have an ingrained piece. Now this isn't super thin. This is a uh, quarter of an inch, maybe seven millimeters thick. It's not very, it's not super thin, but the light shines right through those ingrain fibers. Okay, so now we need to take the tenon off and shape the base of this bowl. Because it has so much moisture in it, if I were to leave that base thick like it is right now, the base would stay wet longer than the rest of the bowl and because there would be an unevenness of moisture content, the bowl would certainly crack apart and just be a big mess. So we don't want that to happen. So what I need to do is I need to shape the bottom of the bowl so that we have the same thickness in the base and in the feet of the bowl. So I'm going to slowly work across here and remove the tenon. And this cut in the pass I'm making right now is I'm mimicking the bottom curve of the bowl as if I were picking up that cut from the outside of, of that foot area. I'm making a pull cut backwards. It's a scraping cut. Only the bottom lower part of the wing of that bowl gouge is engaging and scraping the inside of that foot. And then I'm making a push cut. Again, see how that's continuing the curve of the bowl itself? The idea is that the bottom of this bowl makes the bowl look like it it just flows right through those feet. And it's almost like the feet, that ring that the is the foot of the bowl was just attached to the to the overall full curve of the bowl. And using my bowl gouge, I'm going to nibble away the area in the center of the bottom of the bowl.
and I'll switch over to my spindle detail gouge to finish off that nub. Make it a little bit narrower. I gotta be careful here because I only have a few ingrain fibers holding this all together and the tailstock is critical. I'm gonna push forward and turn the lathe off and the motion of pushing forward severs those grains and the, that little nub just comes right off. Now I'm not gonna be able to sand this right now because it's so wet and it's all ingrained. I'm not gonna be able to sand it at this point. I'll wait for it to dry completely and then I can come back and sand it. And here's how we can test and see if we got the thickness in the bottom of that foot, about the same thickness as the rest of the bowl. It's actually a little bit thicker. You can see how the light isn't quite coming through there as, as much as it is on the sides, but it's very close to the same thickness. How cool is that? I love seeing these rings like that and it just hit me as I stopped here between takes. I counted those rings and I just realized this log is older than me. So that was, that was kind of an eye opener. I, it's, I love seeing nature and I love being able to share something like this. This is such a beautiful piece. So here it is, an ingrain platter, bowl, I think it's a bladder. No, we don't want to call it a bladder. How about a, uh, a pull No, it, it's a bowl. It's just a very, very shallow bowl. It's going to hold about a couple centimeters of soup, not too much. But all in all, I think it's pretty cool, and it really does the trick of showcasing that ingrain, and that was the ultimate goal of turning this. I really wanted to show this piece off, and it's kind of cool that that pith, the center of the tree, is actually off-center in the bowl itself just a little bit. I like that, actually. So now, what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to put it in a paper bag. Now, you might be thinking, why would you put this in a paper bag? Well, if you recall, and I'm going to, I'm going to lightly... I'm going to lightly cover the edges of this and I'm going to tape it together so it's not leaking too much air. If you recall while I was turning this, this is very wet. And when you have a piece of wood that's very wet, we want it to be a controlled drying process. We don't want it to dry super fast. If it dries super fast, it's probably going to crack. So we're actually going to retard that drying process and slow it down. So by putting it in a bag, it's protecting the bowl from the elements any kind of air movement, any sunlight, any excess dryness in the air or moisture in the air. It kind of, think of the bag as a buffer. And that buffering is going to slow the drying process of this bowl. Now, over the course of the next day, the moisture content of this bowl is probably gonna saturate this bag and it's going to make it wet. When it does that, I'm gonna take it out of this bag and I'm gonna put it into a new fresh dry, dry bag until the moisture content has come down quite a bit with the bowl. Now this is a whole other topic in and of itself and it really it really needs its whole its own video, but actually I have a whole e-course, an online e-course I'm working on treatable and I deal with drying and all of that and explain that. But what I want to make clear to you guys is just by putting it in the into a bag is not a magic trick. And Sometimes it won't even solve any problems. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because this bowl is really wet. If you have wood that is semi-wet, maybe it's almost dry and you turn it, there might not be any need for you to put it in a bag. And it also depends on your environment and your climate and how humid it is, how hot it is. Now, if you're in an incredibly dry place, you may need to soak this in water. You need, may, on the lathe, you may need to spray this with water to keep it moist and keep it from drying out. And then once it is finished being turned, you may have to wrap it and keep that moisture in the wood for as long as possible because nature is doing everything it can to extract that moisture immediately. I don't have that situation in my particular environment. And if you do have that also, if you have a relatively dry environment, say in the winter time, 
you could take the wet shavings from the turning that you just did, pick those up off the floor, and stuff those all around the bowl inside the bag. And that adds as additional insulation or buffering to keep that moisture in the bowl and just lets it slowly release. So it's kind of a, think of the bag as a shield from the environment and the bowl. So it's, it's insulating the bowl, so to speak. So there's a lot more to drying wood, and I've got a course that's going to be coming out all about green wood and turning trees into bowls, and you're going to want to check that out. But for the most part, just remember the, the paper bag technique may or may not work for you based on the moisture in the bowl that you turn and your particular environment. So keep that in mind. Thank you so much for watching. And if this video has helped you learn new techniques or has shown you some new ways of doing some turning or possibly what the bag drying method is that we just discussed, then do me a favor, leave me a comment below. I, I always love reading comments. I try to respond to as many as possible. And I love getting feedback from you guys, and I greatly appreciate that. Do me a huge favor and click that like button below the screen if you haven't already. And if you haven't, subscribe to my channel. Click that bell as well. So when the next video comes out, you'll be notified and you won't miss anything. we got lots more videos coming your way. You're going to want to check them out. All right, guys. Thank you so much for watching. And until next time, happy turning.